because if you get me ad-libbing, it's the end. The end. My, my man will bar the door and you'll be here till midnight. I, I want to dedicate this talk to the spirit of a, of a man, a libertarian, who many of you know, Marshall Fritz, who died recently. Marshall and I had many a rousing argument over the years, and right up to a month before his death, we would speak for hours on the telephone, arguing principles. Uh, I'd also like to dedicate this to the spirit of my granddaughter, Christina, age 17, into whom Marshall's spirit seems to have been reborn. She's already been arrested twice and gone to court to change her name. <laughs> Walter Lippmann isn't a name you hear much about these days, but in my father's day when I was a young man, Lippmann was a political philosopher of peculiar power and clarity. It was Lippmann who designed the containment policy which held the Soviet Union in check until it collapsed, although George F. Kennan is often given credit for it. In a speech Lippmann made to the Association for the Advancement of Science in 19. 40, that's 69 years ago, Lippmann had something important to say about the strange new form of American schooling. That's something we all forget, that the kind of schooling we're familiar with was a radical deviation from the past. There is no continuity whatsoever between early American history the federal period, the time up to the Civil War, and what began to transpire in approximately the 1880s. And so in this speech, he said this, the prevailing education, he said, this is a direct quote, is destined to destroy Western civilization and is in fact destroying it. Now, Lippmann was not given to passion or extreme statements. He was a model of intellectual clarity, so he meant precisely what he said. But in fact, what did he mean when he said it's destined to destroy Western civilization? What he meant was that the incursion of a Prussian system of discipline called education, a forced schooling system designed to create obedient soldiers onto our laissez-faire open market system of entrepreneurial education that stressed individual sovereignty and the development of imagination, that the marriage of those two forms would kill the better of the two. Horace Mann had brought Prussian schools into American consciousness in 1843 when he begged the Boston School Committee to bring the Prussian schooling to the United States and inside of a decade, it was not only here, it had spread to New York State and to one other American jurisdiction, one that won't surprise this audience, Washington, D.C. <laughs> At that point, it was stopped cold. No one else showed any interest in the Prussian system, the particulars of which you'll hear in uh, in a moment. So Washington did then what it does now. It ran the printing presses, although we had a gold bank back currency, so that expression may not apply. It laid money around, and one by one, 
it drew the other states into the fold. But you'll be interested to hear that it was not until 1918 that the last American state fell to the Prussian system. Uh, the Prussian system was collectivist. The individual was subordinated in every case, no exceptions, to the health of the political state and the economy and its leadership. So our customized approach, because that's really what we had, there were dozens of different varieties of schooling, and all, none of them were of any extensive tenure. The longest amount of schooling was four months, and the average was much closer to two, two and a half months of schooling. Doesn't mean that the rest of the time was education free. Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America, a French aristocrat, had no doubt that the United States was the best educated country in the history of the world, including classical Greece, and yet we had no system of schooling at all. Probably the norm was what today would be called homeschooling, but as I said, there were dozens of varieties of, of formal, more formalized schooling. So it was during the immigration panics in the 1870s and 1880s that the idea of Prussian schooling began to soften American resistance. And the government kept steadily hammering on the theme that these people needed to be Americanized. But as this audience, unlike any other audience I speak to, certainly usually understands that to impose conformity is a very un-American and also a very unwise idea. It makes people radically incomplete, fearful. True, it makes them easier to manage, but in a human sense, it ruins us. Anyway, under the cover of the public distress caused by mass immigration, uh, we became Prussianized in every corner of America, particularly the coasts. By 1940, Walter Lippmann had witnessed it gnawing deeply into the foundations of American prosperity, which lay in our ingenuity, our self-reliance, and our imagination. Prussian schooling was directly, directly the creation of a philosopher at the University of Berlin who had inherited Immanuel Kant's chair. Uh, his name was Fichte, Johann Fichte, and Fichte demanded publicly of the Prussian king that the imagination of ordinary people be eradicated because it, it added an unpredictable element to the Prussian economy, which largely was based on renting soldiers and invading other countries and stealing their stuff. If the individual soldiers could imagine a different way, could think for themselves, obviously they weren't as efficient from the managerial point of view. And oddly enough, Fichte was not the first major philosopher to call for the destruction of the imagination of the ordinary population. About a hundred years before Fichte, a philosopher who in college classes is considered to be a great liberal, 
The man was Spinoza. He, he knew himself as Benedict Spinoza, but history records him as Baruch Spinoza for reasons that would take another lecture to go into. Anyway, Spinoza, in a book called The Tractate of Religion and Politics, usually you'll see it render, your librarian can order it for you as Tractatus Religico Politicus, Spinoza invented, down to the most minute details, the form of systematic schooling that we have in the United States today, and also in most parts of the world, you know, with minor deviations. Spinoza said the purpose of this was to destroy the imagination and to fill the ordinary mind with such nonsense, with so many contradictions, that they would be unable to oppose, I'll call it management. Spinoza's motivation for saying this is he believed, he believed that about 90% of the human race was permanently eradicatably irrational, dangerously so, murderously so, and they had to be confused so they would turn their murderous impulses inward rather than uh, messing up the lives of the rational few. Uh, and interestingly enough, prior to Spinoza, we have another almost identical formulation several centuries before John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, written by a first-class legal mind, actual lawyer Calvin was, points out that about 95% of the population are hopeless. They're damned before they're born, and no amount of good behavior will reclaim them. And therefore, first you've got to keep this news from them, because it might make them restless. And second, you have to embed them in a system of schooling in which they're taught to chase illusory prizes to wear themselves out competing against one another and so on. And the original father of this idea, and I know that most of you are aware of this, was a classical Greek aristocrat we remember as Plato and in his two utopias uh, the laws is the last of the two, and the Republic is the one most people read. He lays down a system of confused enterprise to render most people harmless. Uh, this idea has traveled directly down to us. I have been unable in years of trying to find a major thinker who rejected this idea, who didn't boost it, and the one that caused the most damage of all, probably the, the you mean that one won't go up and down, huh? <laughs> hey, I have faith. The fellow who caused the most damage, teaching the same idea, but quote scientifically, was none other than our hero of the last couple of weeks, because of his 200th anniversary, Charles Darwin. Most of us don't bother to actually read Darwin. We read a school secondhand account of what Darwin said. But if you go straight to the horse's mouth, you will discover that the human race is not evolving. A tiny fraction of the human race is evolving, mostly blonde-haired, blue-eyed people from Scandinavia, and the rest of the people are evolutionarily retards. 
I'll give you the citation. Is there anyone in here that has any Irish in their background? Let me see your hand if you... Oh, you're going to love this. This will not be the Darwin that you studied in high school. In Descent of Man, that's published in the U.S. in 1871, Darwin says very clearly that if the good stuff, you know, the Scandinavian plums, interact with the bad stuff, and the Irish clearly are his leading candidate for the bad, but the, almost everyone else is bad stuff. Evolution will march backwards into the swirling mists of the dawnless past. <laughs> now Darwin had a phenomenal reputation not as a scientist, although he was getting one by 1871, Origin of Species had been written in 18, published in 1859, but Darwin was a supremely wealthy man. Another fact that your high school biology books leave out as if it were inconsequential, a supremely wealthy man. He was the heir to the Wedgwood fortune, and Wedgwood was you know, the primary social technology of his day. If you didn't own a set of Wedgwood, you were nothing. I mean, nothing. So, so Darwin spoke not to the public, not even to the scientific community. Darwin's associates were the, the kings and the queens, the dukes and the princes of Europe. So he had an immediate effect on let me call them the managerial classes of Europe and the United States. And he said, you've got to create structures that keep the bad protoplasm away from the good protoplasm. As a direct result of Darwin, we had an explosion in the elite private boarding school movement in the United States. We had, I think, six of those prior to Darwin, and we quickly ended up with 600. Say again? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, we had a phenomenal growth of what now is a common institution, the country club. We had elite sections in colleges, even non-elite colleges, and there must be a dozen other uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, protections against the bad stuff intermarrying with the good stuff. And it became one of the secret guiding principles of managerial logic at that time, and I do believe ever afterwards. Uh, in any case, uh, this is what Lippmann saw entering the entrepreneurial uh, wide open, I call it the open source method, genius of American education. So I'm going to start with telling you a different way that this was done and is being done now under our noses, but it isn't touching nearly enough of us. The school question of the moment is this, can we create more sensible uses for the time of America's young than sentencing them to bells and chair time and memory drills for 12 years? What might we do instead? What we might think about doing before we thought about specifics is making gigantic cracks in this Prussian machine. We can't abandon it because it's the leading employer in the United States if you factor in all of the collateral businesses that depend on schooling like textbooks and driving the truck to deliver the textbooks, etc the bologna makers and the only, the final market for bologna is. <laughs> so I call the process 
that we, we, I think we need to evolve to, or devolve to, since we had it at one time. I call it open source learning. And rather than define that for you right away, I'm going to illustrate it at work with living examples. One of the examples which we won't be able to talk to, you have here, during a time of great political chaos in New York schools, between 1975 and say 1982, phenomenal chaos. You, you, you couldn't make a movie about what the interior of Manhattan schools looked like. I don't mean ghetto schools. I lived in the Gold Coast of the Upper West Side. Couldn't make a movie about it that anyone would believe. I mean, there were, well, there are ladies in the room, so I can't say rapes on a weekly basis inside the schools, public displays of fornication, kids at the front door selling booze at an inflated price, I might say. <laughs> so, but I'm going to show you some examples of open source at work right now in the world around you on a minute scale. Uh, the schooling we know of is a religious phenomenon. Its assumptions are based on faith, not on any fact that they produce superior results. It's a substitute, in fact, for religion, just as the Dutch philosopher Spinoza said that it would become. My first example of open source learning is an automobile mechanic who dropped out of junior high school at the age of 13. His name is Jonathan Goodwin, and if you're on uh, the internet, you can Google the, the cover of Fast Company magazine for November 2007 and you'd be looking square in the face, the homely face, I might add, although my editor objected to me saying, I'm not sure Jonathan wouldn't object, of a dirt poor kid from a Kansas farm family of seven kids, drops out of junior high school at 13, and does what innumerable kids do and have done. He hangs out at the local garage. Can you see any future for Jonathan Goodwin? How on earth does he go from there in 20 years to the cover of Fast Company magazine? As he told Fast Company, after dropping out of seventh grade, he made a living rebuilding cars ruined in accidents. He bought the wrecks for a few bucks and made them, I'm quoting, good as new. That was my school, said Jonathan. Even as a teenager, Jonathan could see that technology already existed to get between 60 and 100 miles a gallon. 100 on an ordinary car, 60 miles a gallon on a Hummer. How about that? He saw that it was easy to double the horsepower and to push the emissions close to zero. And why, he asked himself at about age 15, wasn't Detroit doing this? You and I know, but Jonathan didn't know. I can do it myself, he thought. So living in California, he began to offer conversions for a Hummer, he'd guarantee you 60 miles a gallon, you pay him $25,000. But with gas at $4 a gallon and a Hummer getting about three to four miles to a gallon, you know, you can make that 25 grand up pretty quickly. Did people laugh at this cheeky kid? No, they lined up giving him more business than he could handle and his best customer was the governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who owned seven Hummers. 
That was 175 grand right there, and it took Jonathan 50 days. Uh, today he does four a month, 48 a year, and his income is more than a million dollars per annum. Jonathan struck out on his own at age 13, the very same age that the first admiral in the American Navy, David Farragut, assumed command of his first warship and sailed it from Peru to Boston with the enemy crew below deck. The very same age Thomas Jefferson was when he took control of a huge plantation and 250 employees. <clears throat> so now you know about one person who pursued an open course rather than a bell-driven, subject-driven, test-driven discipline. Now since I did a fella first, in fairness I have to do a lady. On April the 20th, 2008, Danica Patrick, 100 pounds of driving fury in a five foot two inch frame, became the first woman in big time race car history to win a major event. She was driving against the two time Indianapolis 500 winner, Helio Castroneves, in the Indy Japan 300, and she overtook the world champ in the final two laps and coasted home going away. She told interviewers, this reaches outside racing. This is about finding something you love to do and following through with it. Ten years earlier, at the age of 16, Danica had dropped out of high school and discovered that she wanted to become a race car driver. The only place in the world that teaches you to sustain speeds of over 200 miles an hour, eat your heart out, State Cop, uh, was London, England. So she got herself to London, England at age 16, all by herself, no chaperones, and she learned to drive a car faster than 200 miles an hour, hour after hour after hour. Of course, and I think that her gender has something to do with this, Danica makes about four million a year in commercial endorsements there. But now I want to talk about a neighbor of mine, Nick Schulman. We never have met. He just turned 21 on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I think he would have gone to my junior high school, except I had quit teaching by then, and Nick had dropped out in junior high school to play pool. I don't know what his mother felt about that. <laughs> Two years later, after they got him back into high school, he dropped out to concentrate on playing computer games. And in 2005, at the age of 18, Nick took up poker. For Nick, it was the psychology of poker that gripped him, reading your opponent's uh, intentions through little signs they give out. On February the 28th of last year, the newspapers announced that Nick had just won $2 million on the World Poker Tour, and he said he was now ready, I'm quoting, for a different kind of fulfillment with two million in his back pocket, Nick had decided he was going to go to college and turn his attention to philosophy. You know, Aquinas, Bacon, Hegel, Hobbes, Heidegger, Rorty, that sort of person. How do you suppose Mother Schulman felt then? Good luck, Nick. 
at least you won't be paying back student loans until you're 50. <laughs> now I'll shift back to a lady. My wife insisted I do this as long as I had enough ladies to go. I guess if your own teenage daughter changed her name to Diablo, <laughs> you would shrug it off as a passing whim of teenage fancy. But what if she announced that her life's ambition was to be a stripper and she set up a pornographic blog whose title I wouldn't dream of reading in front of a mixed <laughs> eye. What, what would you think? Would your daughter be on the right career track? Would she have a bright future ahead? Now flash forward to the year 2008 and Diablo is now 29 and she is on the stage at the Oscar ceremonies in Hollywood receiving the Oscar for best screenplay for the movie Juno. Did anyone see Juno in here? It's a nice flick there. She had published a book two years earlier, Candy Girl, publication date 2006, uh, and now the movie Juno. Diablo told the crowd, by the way, she was wearing a cut to the thigh leopard print gown which showed off an enormous tattoo that ran over her body, up her shoulder, onto her neck of a stripper. She told the crowd, most of all, I want to thank my family for loving me exactly the way I am. Can you imagine a school ever accepting Diablo the way she was? <laughs> Can you imagine her thanking a school for its support? <laughs> Danica, Diablo, Nick, and Jonathan followed personal roads to very individualized educations under their own management. All of them traveled under the same umbrella, a strategy, as I've told you, I call open source learning, inspired by, I was inspired by Linus Torvald and his open system computer system. So different from the tight-fisted retrograde habit of Microsoft, Open source learning allows everything under the sun as a possible starting point on the road to self-mastery. In open source, every sequence is subject to personalization. Every body is a potential teacher. In open source, in fact, teaching isn't a profession, it's a function. Anyone with something of value to offer can teach as long as people come to learn from that person. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right there you can see the basic assumptions are different. No student can be threatened with failure if he or she decides not to learn from you. In open source, Students are active partners in reality, not in rhetoric. They select many or even all of the areas they want to explore. They recruit many or even all of their own instructors. They assemble a team of learning colleagues. It sounds too promiscuous, I know, too undisciplined, but in the real world, of laws, customs, and parental rights. Everything is by negotiation, isn't it? Every situation is one of a kind. But all parties to the negotiations accept that nobody can give you an education. An education must be taken by those who want one. The will and the dogged persistence of the seeker are the only essential tools needed to become educated. Teachers, texts, money, and equipment play only minor roles, and paper-pencil tests 
play no role at all. Now, now I, I, I'd like to move from, from these simple, ordinary examples to some pretty big time examples. A few years ago, the Tyson Krupp Steel Corporation of Germany decided to unload its mighty Phoenix steel plant in Dortmund on China. Steel prices were down. It looked to management as if they would stay down. So a command decision was made to push Phoenix, all 200 acres of buildings, onto China, even though that would throw 10,000 Germans out of work, some of them from families which had worked at Phoenix for 200 years, generation after generation. Phoenix had made the cannon for the Napoleonic Wars. Management expected two payoffs, one in the sales price, one in the moving bill, <coughs> excuse me, for a job it estimated would take three years and an army of specialized engineers and technicians. China bought the plant, but not the moving charge. China said it would move Phoenix itself. Lots of luck, huh? Where do they know about dismantling steel mills? One fine day, a raggedy band of a thousand peasants led by a ham-handed, unschooled peasant named Shen Wen Rong opened up in Dortmund. By the way, the story is from the Financial Times, March 17, 2006, because otherwise it would be unbelievable. Shen was an odd duck as a project manager. He didn't use a computer. He didn't have a real office, and he worked from a child's school desk. His first decision was to escape German housing and meal costs, so the crew built its own dormitories and commissary on the property in 21 days. Then they broke Phoenix down, crated it, shipped it, uncrated it, and reassembled it in one year, not three. Numerous rules were broken in the process. <laughs> These amateur deconstructionists set aside time-honored rules for proceeding, taught in engineering schools and codified in statute whenever more creative problem-solving seemed appropriate. In the time it took to complete the move, China's huge orders for steel on world markets drove prices through the roof, exactly as Chinese planners figured would happen when they bought Phoenix. The plant was a big money maker in China right from the first day, just as it would have been if it had been kept in Dortmund. Not only did the ignorant Chinese outwork the trained and well-educated Germans, they outthought them too. How have we allowed ourselves to be fooled into believing that experts and specialists are needed for matters within the reach of ordinary people? How have we been taught to think so little of ourselves? If a farmer and an amateur construction crew of farmers can tear down and put back up a huge steel plant three times faster than experts say it can be done, then you and I need to rethink a lot of what we've been carefully conditioned in schools to accept as truth. <laughs> well, this presentation actually has a title, although I don't know if it's in the program. It's called Walk About London, and now let me penetrate the mystery of that. One of the 25 wealthiest individuals in the world in 2009 is the high school dropout, Sir Richard Branson. Branson thinks the most important lesson 
he ever learned was at the age of four when he took an open source adventure in the London suburb of Shamley Green. Fifty-two years after the event, he remembered vividly how it happened. This was in last May 2007 issue of New Yorker. There's a profile of Branson in which he remembers this story. He was on a drive with his mother, miles from home, single parent family, by the way, when she asked him whether he thought he could find his way home alone from where they were, age four. Try to picture some four-year-old you know. And she said, could you find your way home alone from here, Richard? And he said he thought he could, and she pulled the car over at once. Get out then and do so, she said. <laughs> and she drove off, not to a safe distance and watched the little bugger. Now she went home. <laughs> Probably poured pour, pour a drink. <laughs> of course, he did it. By the age of 12, he was taking 100-mile bike trips, round trip to the beach at Bournemouth. Quote, mother was determined to make us independent, he said, over a half century after the walk. Later, after a very brief go at high school, he dropped out, <clears throat> never wasting a day at college, waiting his turn. It wasn't a moneyed family. His mother was a stewardess in the days when that was a, a dicey profession. At 19, he had his first successful business. His moon rocket and Virgin Airlines were launched without walk, although it took some time to have. Front pages of the New York Press last year was a picture of Branson standing next to his already built moon rocket for which he sold 250 seats at 200,000 a ticket, it'll probably be leaving sometime this year. Is age four too young to tackle serious business? Well, before you answer, a two-year-old Tiger Woods was sinking putts on the Mike Douglas TV show in preparation for redefining the game of golf years later, after he dropped out of college. Branson's successful walkabout and the dirt farmer savvy of Shen Wen Rong are only possible in the classroom of the greater world. All my life I've heard repeatedly that people without diplomas are ruined, and those without degrees doomed to be nobodies. You've heard that too, I know. So how do we account for our two best presidents, Washington and Lincoln, having almost no school? Or America's legendary industrialists, Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, both being elementary school dropouts? <clears throat> And of course, the entire army of fast food billionaires are in the same boat. Perhaps you think it was possible way back when, but not now, and certainly not in the sciences, right? We have to agree that those require bell-driven, test-driven, subject-driven classes. But if that's true, how can we explain the Human Genome Project, the world's most prestigious scientific project? It was created by two men. One was Francis Collins, unschooled on a remote sheep ranch in Western Virginia by his mother, using a wildly open source methodology with no template at all. The logic of Collins' schooling imposed by his mother was follows. There were four brothers. They had to agree on what they wanted to study. They then studied it as long as they felt like it. 
They could only get off the track, however, if all four agreed, and now for something different. Uh, so he was half of the Human Genome Project. No specialty in science at all. The other half is perhaps even more unexpected. He just published his autobiography, and his name is Craig Venter. He was a very, very bad student, I believe in a San Diego school, and he cut school constantly. He was a self-proclaimed surfer bum who graduated only by the skin of his teeth when one teacher changed an F to a D in order to get rid of the louse. <laughs> then those two eventually teamed up and we had the human genome map. I, I need a stretcher is what I need, but no. <laughs> no, I'm from Pittsburgh once we get the bit between our teeth. On April the 27th, 2007, so less than two years ago, national headlines announced the firing of MIT's famous director of admissions, Marilee Jones. She had been dismissed in disgrace after 28 years of splendid service in which she won MIT's highest honors. <coughs> Jones was a specialist at female recruitment. During her long tenure, she tripled the number of women at MIT. She was hailed from coast to coast among the admissions fraternity. Press questioning of MIT students at the time of her dismissal called her beloved, almost revered, and irreplaceable. I took that from the Wall Street Journal story. So why was she scanned, uh, canned? Molestation of students? Selling MIT secrets to Microsoft? No, none of the above. Some diligent snoop had discovered that the college degree she claimed at the time of her hiring 28 years earlier were fakes. Ooh. She had actually been, if I gave you a thousand guesses, no one in this room would come close, I wouldn't either. She had actually been a nightclub torch singer in upstate New York country western nightclubs <laughs> until the moment MIT took her in. Now why anyone with a good job like that would wish? <laughs> anyway. MIT Chancellor Philip Clay told reporters the door was now closed forever on another torch singer in admissions. Quote, in future, he said, we will take a big lesson from this experience. Now, what lesson might that be? It couldn't be the obvious lesson that degrees are only magical talismans. They promise nothing, and only meritorious performance is the proper measure of quality. Couldn't be that. What degree should we give bureaucrat Clay for costing MIT a brilliant colleague who added great value to the school? The colossal jerk degree? <laughs> Drop, <laughs> dropping school does not mean dropping education. That's the real lesson. Think of Ingvar Kamprad, diagnosed as dyslexic by the usual school experts. Ingvar began his independent life since he had been pronounced hopeless as a student in Denmark as a bicycle peddler of fish. Can you think of a harder job than peddling up to somebody with a fish? So I want to buy this fish. <laughs> Gradually he, he added matches to his basket and finally 
he finished it off with Christmas decorations. Well, what about a Christmas decoration? You don't want the fish. <laughs> no, the decoration smells like fish. <laughs> then, bit by bit, Ingvar founded IKEA to reflect his egalitarian philosophy that beauty and utility should be available to everybody, not just the prosperous. That fish peddler is worth 31 billion today, but much more important than his wealth is his ongoing determination to add value to lives other than his own. When you understand yourself so thoroughly, you can write your own script instead of following the orders of strangers or the common paths of your time. You must be among the small group on the road to education. Migrant fruit picker Charles Webb fits this description for me. You probably heard of Charles because of his creation 45 years ago of an American classic story, The Graduate, which in book form sold millions of copies and as a movie became a runaway hit. Charles and his wife, her name is Fred, Charles and Fred <laughs> made a hundred million and they were on the 18 guest list all over the world. And guess what they did with their hundred million? They gave every penny of it away Charles said, wealth didn't work for us, he told a reporter, and they became migrant fruit pickers in California, living in trailers. The world is just much different than the ordinary narratives uh, allow us to imagine. Every school day in America, 7,000 young men and women drop out of school, some confused, some brave, all of them angry. If we had any national coherence or leadership, we would look at these people as a great resource and treat them with respect. One and a quarter million people a year, no different as genius possibilities than the dropout Benjamin Franklin or the dropout Richard Branson or the dropout Wright brothers or the slum urchin Lula da Silva grown to the presidency of Brazil without a school certificate and on the verge of making his nation free of petroleum probably next year, but certainly over the next two years. More than a million American young a year do not want to be in a classroom. I think that would be 20 million if they were offered a choice to help America become a new nation again. If we said, help us build a new nation, those of you who want to, the rest of you stay in class. <laughs> If things really were as we've been taught to believe, how could Lula the urchin be the head of a complex modern nation? How could the semi-urchin Adolf Hitler rise to the leadership of the best schooled country on record? How could Thomas Edison drop out of elementary school before he was 12 leave home, go west with no money or no contacts during the Civil War years and by age 15 have four solid streams of revenue and a write-up in the London Times. How could this penniless dropout invent the electric light, the phonograph, win 1,003 patents and create the mighty corporation that was to become General Electric. By the way, he set up an entry examination for jobs and he said no college graduate ever passed the test. 
How can any of these things be true if what you've been taught was even remotely correct? Why has no school, no politician, no foundation, no public institution ever connected the dots for you as I just did? Was that in your best interests? In the year 2006, the University of Connecticut wanted to discover how much learning occurred between entering college as a freshman and graduating as a senior. They selected five academic areas for study and they picked 50 colleges to measure. A total of 14,000 undergraduates were randomly selected to participate. Nobody on this planet could have anticipated the result. In 16 of the 50 colleges, which included Yale, Brown, and Georgetown, the graduating seniors knew less than the incoming freshmen. <laughs> In the other 34, there was no measurable growth evident, although up to a quarter of a million dollars had been invested in an average of six years of time. After all the exaggerations, college for many is still just school. On April the 13th, 2008, the television show 60 Minutes reported that a cancer patient, John Kansias, had developed a heretofore unknown method of attacking tumors, which Nobel Prize winning cancer researcher Rick Smalley said, quote, would change medicine forever, adding that in 20 years of cancer research, it was the most impressive development he had ever seen. <coughs> Excuse me. Kansas method destroys tumors without chemotherapy, surgery, or the familiar kind of radiation. What impressed the 60-minute producers was that Kansas had no college degree and no background in science or medicine. But as a boy, he had been obsessively an amateur radio buff building shortwave units. He knew as one of the many odd facts that hobbyists accumulate that radio waves passed through metal will heat the metal up to a high temperature. Now in late middle age, contemplating his own death, he wondered if his tumors could be injected with metal, bombarded with radio waves, and the cancer would be killed by the ensuing heat. Kansas tested his theory in his garage on a raw hot dog. That was his equipment. <laughs> Using a machine he constructed out of used pie tins. When the bottom of the wiener was injected with metal and shot through with radio waves, it cooked while the top of the dog remained cool. Preliminary work in university laboratories where he took his finding seemed to show that indeed radio waves do kill cancer when the tumor is filled with nanoparticles of metal, something the vast, specialized, educated empire of cancer care never managed to stumble upon in its many decades of existence. It took a non-scientist without a college degree, motivated by 36 rounds of chemotherapy, which left him so sick he couldn't sleep to uncover this connection. The assessment tools pedagogy has devised, and for you libertarians, I hope you know what the word pedagogy derives from. It Pedagogy also exists, pedagogists in Latin. It's a class of slave who takes orders from the master 
and imposes drills and discipline on the and doesn't create anything, but simply transmits the orders of the master. So what we've what we've allowed to transmit through 23 centuries to uh, a modern America is a term for the profession. It's a profession of slaves. In pedagogy, you would be the science of preparing these slaves for their function. I don't think that that transmission is either an accident or insignificant. The young people we can find in schools today once cleared this continent when it was still wild. They whipped the greatest military power on earth. Most of the uh, revolutionary army, including its officer corps, were teenagers. The Marquis de Lafayette was 17. Alexander Hamilton, a colonel, was 19. George Washington was the old man of the revolution at 42. They whipped the greatest military power on earth, not once but twice, drove out the French and Spanish, invented novel technologies, built roads, canals, cities, sold ice to faraway India, and spread open source creativity over every aspect of American culture. A major reason they were able to produce so many miracles, from the six-shooter to the steamboat to manned flight, was they weren't weakened by the phony concept of adolescence, for which there's not a scrap of scientific evidence, or by any artificial extension of childhood through forced schooling. Early American society celebrated accomplishment, as any frontier society must, before the politicians and the schemers collude to build managerial sinecures for themselves. The economy prior to the Civil War was dominated by independent livelihoods. As Abraham Lincoln told the Wisconsin Agricultural Association in 1859, it had room for anyone of energy and ideas, whether they lived in a mudsill shack or behind brass knocker doors. Foreign visitors were dazzled by the energy released by a society so revolutionarily egalitarian, one which mixed all ages together, learning from one another. The Civil War changed everything. In the northern industrial state, which emerged in its wake, entrepreneurialism was unwelcome. Factories and finance came to rule the roost, and with that transformation, people with minds of their own became troublesome to management. Lives assigned to follow orders are, from a management perspective, best kept childish. Childish people obey. Children make the best customers. They have no sales resistance. Since Plato, a long string of utopian thinkers, has worked to supply society's managers with algorithms which lead to childish lives, they all begin with wiping the slate as clean as possible of close emotional ties to family, to religion, and so on. All these things interfere with the authority of managers, and no loyalty is more dangerous than self-respect in independent minds and characters, which open source learning virtually guarantee. That's why schools function as they do, as environments actively hostile to open source strategy. They're built to serve different purposes. I think at this point, I'm going to give you 
like a seven minute break and I'm going to sit here and just rest my voice because we're getting to the good part. <laughs> I call this section the honor roll. And part of it, one or two of the names you've heard, Craig Venter, the beach bum, inter instrumental in giving the world the first map of the human genome, was born in 1946. S school board Venter out of his mind an offense he punished by driving his teachers crazy. And he staggered to junior high school, staggered out of school into a but private uh, role in the U.S. Army over in Vietnam where he became a medical corpsman. It was there he learned to despise bureaucracy. <laughs> and got the shock of his life with heads and hands laying all over the place. And that shocked him into a solidly responsible life. His book, A Life Decoded, has only been out a couple of months. It's certainly worth reading. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a C average in high school and a C average in college. John F. Kennedy had a C average in high school and a C average in college. The next one won't surprise you. George W. Bush had a C average in high school and a C average in college, but this might surprise you. Bush's C average was one point higher than Senator John Kerry's C average. <laughs> Al Gore, flunked out of his first college and squeaked to his second with a C minus average. Dick Cheney, the famous vice president, flunked out too. When his SAT scores in language and math are added together, the legendary progressive senator Paul Wellstone scored 800 as a total. Now, it's true that in his day, the max was only 1,600, where now I believe it's 2,400, but still, that's a 50. America's global computer dominance arose, as I told you, from men without college degrees. Ted Turner, founder of the worldwide news service CNN, dropped out freshman year. William Faulkner, one of our Nobel Prize Authors got a D in English in his freshman year in college and dropped out then and there, never to return. Warren Avis, who pioneered auto rentals at airports, considered college, but decided against it as a waste of time and money. Ed Hamilton, the nation's largest independent mail order book dealer, told me the time and money he saved by not going to college gave him a real head start over his competition and was the foundation of his eventual success. Sean Fanning, whose invention of Napster at age 18 almost ruined the multi-billion dollar music industry, was hired by that industry at age 24 in excuse me, 2007, to come up with a plan to save it. Sean has no college, and he told the paper that I read this interview in, he has no plans to get any college. Lou Wasserman, who more than anyone else created modern Hollywood with his colossal MCA talent agency, had no college and almost no attendance in high school. Although he has a high school diploma, he preferred instead to work full time as a movie usher beginning at age 13. So how did he get a diploma working as a movie usher? In an interesting fashion, he approached the school principal with a deal 
the administrator could not refuse. In exchange for a diploma, but he wouldn't attend classes, Wasserman smuggled first-run films out of the theater in the morning before it opened, took them to the high school where they were screened for an admissions prize, got them back to the theater before it opened. The school was able to use the money earned to buy band instruments and uniforms so the principal looked like a hero to parents. He used the time saved from copying notes off blackboards to set up MCA, signing stars when he's still a teenager like Fred Astaire and the Gish sisters to long-term contracts. The legal instruments he created as a teenage boy with no legal training at all are still used as models in law school today for show business and uh, litigation. And if that seems far-fetched to any of you, just remember Shen Wen Rung in the Phoenix Steel Plant in Dortmund, Germany, or Marilee Jones in the MIT Admissions Office. Warren Buffett, once again as I speak the world's richest man, began in business at the age of six selling ice-cold Coca-Cola and chewing gum door-to-door -door in Depression-era Omaha, that's age six. By stages, he added other businesses to his string. He sold retrieved golf balls in bulk to the club pro shop. He sifted discarded racetrack betting tickets in bulk, searching for winners accidentally thrown away. He set up a mass production newspaper delivery operation in which he personally could deliver 1,500 papers. He rented pinball machines to barber shops and split the take 50-50, and this is all before Warren was 15. From the age of 13, he supported himself completely, and by age 18, he had the present-day equivalent of a hundred grand in the bank when the Wharton Business School turned him down for admission. <laughs> Schools don't even hint at the existence of such a road to self-sufficiency. Imagine if 60 million trapped school children were set to actively imagining personal ways to add value to the general community, just like Buffett did at their age. Suppose from kindergarten, boys and girls were flooded with examples of how opportunity can be developed and managed. Wouldn't our country be crowded with Buffett's inventors and Fannings and Wasserman's, even Mozart's. Isn't that what this nation needs? Not more zombies, not more parasites. It isn't wild speculation. What I've just done is to carry your imagination back to the colonial days in Ben Franklin's Philadelphia, where the crackling energy of limitless possibility wasn't created by any task force of experts but by everybody getting a chance at a turn just as soon as they felt able in an environment where possibilities were everywhere. Now, I want to tell you about a Dutch city that actually exists, and I know a lot of you passed through Amsterdam, take a couple hours off, rent a car and go to Drachten, D-R-A-C-H-T-E-N. The Dutch city of Drachten had an immense traffic problem. It took hours to get to this small place. You know, and lots of accidents occurred because motorists got hot under the car. I see someone laughing who knows the story of Drogden. 
what Trotkin did after discussing the many genius ways of putting up signs to discipline parking and, and motoring through town was simply to go in the opposite direction. It did away with all traffic signs, all parking meters, and even parking spaces. The result so far has been shocking. Traffic safety has improved dramatically. Speed of transit is five times faster than it had been with all the police and the regulations and the signs and the flashing lights. Under some circumstances, it seems, people will take it upon themselves to look out for their own and other people's best interest, interests. I got that from a book called The Future of the Internet. Jonathan Zittrain is the author. And now I'd like to refresh your memory about St. Paul's letters to the new congregations that one day were to become the Christian movement, but at the beginning were just widely scattered uh, groups that didn't know one another. And they were looking for a set of rules to follow. And Paul traveled with the conveyances of the day between these far scattered little places and he brought a message to them. And the message, even after all these years, is shocking. And I seldom meet religious people who swear by the Bible and who've read this many times who actually heard what Paul was saying. St. Paul's New Testament letters to the congregations, which later became the Christian movement, are filled with fervent calls to ignore the rules. I swear that's true. Rules, Paul said, corrupted the establishment of his day in a variety of ways. Paul writes that salvation will not be found through obeying the rules. Think of a surfing bum cracking the human genetic code or a movie usher giving shape to the American film industry as examples of this. Screen the religious content from Paul and you're left with the school problem of our day. It's a conflict between those whose status and income depends on keeping things pretty much as they are. Think of the testing industry, for example, and an insurgency motivated by a different logic. Make up the rules as you go along, Paul says, in different words. Adapt to local conditions. And as long as you remain true to the root Christian principle of loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself, things will work out whatever you do. The political establishment of Paul's day, like the school establishment of our own, had a recipe for everything. It was pledged to certainty. You find a thief, you cut off his nose. You find an adulteress, you stone her to death. When in doubt, don't think, just follow the rules. But this new insurgency traveled a different road, which most people can't understand today, even people who believe they're good Christians. What the new insurgency said, if somebody steals your coat, give him your cloak. If somebody hits you on the left side of your face, turn the right side to be hit as well. Pay the working men who labor only for the afternoon the same wage as those who work from early sunrise. Rule book people find these pronouncements incomprehensible. In our day, a majority of Americans have been trivialized and disenfranchised by the algorithms of schools, colleges, and corporations, three heads on the same snake. In spite of the all-pervasive sway of these command and control formulae, a powerful new insurgency is springing forth. So far, without organizing very much, 
the internet organized insurgency has jeopardized huge commercial operations in music, in film, broken the security of banks and government installations, and stolen tens of millions of identities, one every three seconds. It appears to be aiming to upset the whole notion of patents and copyrights, as China has already done. As China has already upset that notion of patents by stealing from anyone they want to steal from without paying any penalty for their robberies. The formulas for powerful weapons, like the peroxide paint remover and drain cleaner bomb, which paralyzed London a few years ago, circulate widely. And they're in every hardware store in the country for about for about fifty bucks. I tell I tell anti gun audiences we better get rid of hydrogen peroxide first and drain cleaner because that makes a much bigger bang. <laughs> and what we've learned, I think, from Iraq and Afghanistan, I'm not defending and it takes sides in any of this. Just saying the lessons are clear. What we've learned from Iraq and Afghanistan, and what we should have learned from Vietnam, is that ordinary people whose lives are driven by principle, whether you agree with the principle or not, it's irrelevant, refuse to be intimidated by overwhelming military force. They can't be conquered. The day of the expert and of privileged information seems almost over. This is a time of the sweat bath, of oceans boiling over, of underground explosions, of the planet whirled away, of extermination sure to follow. I'm quoting Rambo, the poet, my French isn't all that good. In a time of a sweat bath, do you want next to your side watching your back A students or do you want walkabout graduates like Richard Branson? Will you hire valedictorians or surf bums like Craig Venter? We need far less professionalization, which is a kind of social hardening of the arteries, not more. We need to deal the young in on every new design as partners, not as human resources. We need a quality of human interconnection suggested by YouTube and MySpace and Facebook. We need to use school to discover new knowledge, not to exclusively memorize the old to add value to the community right now, not in the future. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you. you, you you've got some time to ask questions. Uh, Gene, are you going to run this? or? No, sure. We have 15 minutes, so go ahead. What would you say to someone who said that the people that you have given as examples the exceptions to the rule. The question is, what would I say to the people who I often meet who say, these people are exceptions to the rules? Well, what I would say, first of all, is that I taught in a Manhattan junior high school for 30 years. In 15 years of that time, I assembled a hodgepodge of a class, and I set them to doing extraordinary things. This is one class newspaper. All of these things are going on simultaneously. Some are being done by flunk outs, some by C students. Just look at a few of these. Here's a successful lawsuit on page one by a C student. At the very same time, my kids are getting more new registrations 
than the entire Democratic Party on the west side of Manhattan. They worked for a month. We cut school for two days and topped their tone. Here's a girl on page two who ended up winning an all expenses paid PhD at some California university who is castigating the Central Board of Education for not teaching entrepreneurialism. Where did she get the idea to do that? She came to me and said that her mother was a liar. And her mother said she could go to Paris if she could raise the money to support herself over the girl's 13, mind you. She said, no 13-year-old can raise that money. I said, not with an after-school job. That's a small amount of money for a business. I said, why don't you set up a business? And she said, 13-year-olds can't set up a business. I said, if people want to buy your product, they don't care how old you are. So I taught her cut school for a week, and she came back with the idea of making one-of-a-kind gifts uh, using the ladies in old age homes who, after all, were paying four or $5,000 a month on the West Side, using them to make one-of-a-kind art gifts, sweater, uh, scarf, hat combination. And then she took the lady's picture, did her bio, and sold them to uh, rich girls at Barnard College uh, for top dollar and through New York City. She made plenty of money. She made much more money than she needed. I said, why don't you take your mother to Paris? She might appreciate it. <laughs> there. Here is, uh, well, go through the paper. This is 30 days of work, and this went on year after year. I came to see that the bell curve is some sort of an artifact of the way we do business. Genius and talent are as cheap as the air we breathe, and you think, well, that's an impossibly romantic thing to say, but I was one of the founders of the Conservative Party in New York State, and I was a party officer for 20 years, so I can't be accused of wild romanticism, can I? <laughs> anyway, another question, please. They're looking through the wrong lens. Yes, ma'am. I do have a question uh, about a graph that I've seen uh, that separates IQ and uh, educational level as predictors of um, earning power later in life. Do you know the graph that I'm talking about? So how would you explain that? Just simply discrimination by employers driving down the average for people without high school diplomas or what is it that's going on there? Uh. You know, I really wish we had a couple of hours, because not only is that an intelligent question, but even the one that I gave short shrift to should have, should have gotten half an hour. <laughs> there are forces at work that the conscious, rational mind is unaware of. Let me give you an example of one of those forces. You doubtless have taken standardized reading tests, correct? And yet, I could give you <clears throat> a simple reading test that if you did well on the standardized test, you would fail. I would ask you to read the first 20 pages of an extremely simple, famous novel, all quiet on the Western Front. And I would ask you three questions, which over 15 years of administering this test, I never found a kid who scored off the top in the reading scale to be able to answer, even when finally in desperation I gave it as an open book test. <laughs> and in order to derive some explanation of what was going on, it suddenly dawned on me that the, the better class of test reader figures out very quickly, maybe in third grade, what type of information is going to be tested. And then when you read, you deliberately, without realizing it, screen out all the stuff that isn't going to be asked as a question because you've got a good sense of pattern. As a consequence, I could make a whole test up out of information that's not typically asked. Uh, for example, in the first scene in the book, the German military unit 
at a field kitchen is eating double rations, and yet double rations are against the law, and the German army punishes infractions very severely. So how was the field cook convinced to give them double rations? I asked that question. Not a single person out of hundreds and hundreds of the best readers. And then finally I gave it as an open book. They still couldn't answer it. Well, they got double rations because the other unit who was going to eat there had been wiped out to a man. And when the cook denied them the extra sausage and potatoes, one sharp guy, the narrator of the book, says yes, but the most severe infraction is wasting food. And when they come around and see that you've wasted half the food, your neck will be in a noose. And the cook is caught in this dilemma. And finally, well, anyway, no, nobody could answer the question because that's not the kind of question that's asked. Your reading has been shaped by scoring well. The only antidote is if your parents actually know how to read and they read for nuances and for tiny detail and for connecting the dots instead of memorizing them. Uh, so, so these results that emerge are frequently cooked in advance. That's an expression from, uh, from chess puzzles. Uh, they're predestinated, the answer, and then it can be made to seem that the results are falling one way because obviously these are superior people. Over 30 years teaching, I absolutely know that if you took all the A students and put them in a class, and you had to pick A students as a class, B, C combined, and D, F, the one class you would never select to get results of the A students, unless what you wanted were clerks and order takers. Someone else. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any way to uh, like become a doctor or a lawyer without like having to go through school? Because uh, it's of course a wonderful question, isn't it? Yeah. You repeat the question. You can rig the game in advance by saying you must do so and so on SATs, or you must do X, Y, and Z, or we won't let you on this professional track. You can do it. Are there ways to beat that? I would guess the answer is yes, but I would hardly have uh, to, but, but I would say by all means look and ask your local doctor, y you know. Yes, sir. I've never heard of you prior to this day, and I'm really happy that you describe your vision as uh, open source education. I'm wondering, and this might be a bit controversial, many of us, you know, I think in this room are involved in the open source technology movement, and obviously the open source technology movement, I think in its most cerebral way, is very much fueled by the psychedelic experience and by psychedelic drugs. And I think for a lot of people, I remember the day in 2004 when I was sitting with a friend who was under the influence of LSD. I remember the night that I began the thought process that made me realize that I didn't need government and has, by extension, made me have new thoughts about education. So where do you see the psychedelic mind in the future paradigm of education? That's a question which, of necessity, I'm going to duck. <laughs> <laughs> I think Barry has a question. Barry. Now, I, I was warned to be very slow about turning from one side of the room to the other. I, I, I'll be glad to discuss that with you. Though. I was, I was going to add, I don't know who, answered, who asked the previous question, but I have a two-part answer. I don't with respect to doctors, but I sat next to a gal uh, one time who was a lawyer. She did not have an undergrad degree and dropped out of, of uh, law school and took the bar and passed it and practices law in California currently. And, uh, and I'm an airline pilot, which is one of the other of the big three, and I don't have an accredited high school diploma or a college degree. So these things are possible if you have the motivation and wiggle room to figure out how to do them. So that's an answer for you well, thank to you. take yes. with you. Yes, ma'am. What's your advice for dealing with the 
rage and grief that come when you realize how much of your own life has been yeah. squandered. Yeah. <laughs> I'm set. What's the advice for when you discover for your own life? I'm 75 and I'm still discovering indwelling curiosity cutoffs to use. Uh, uh, oh God, anyway, to borrow somebody's expression, uh, one flow of the cuckoo's nest. Who's that guy? Ken Kesey. I'm discovering these curiosity cutoffs that were planted long ago and I'm ripping them out and just when I think I'm totally free I'll find another. You start where you are and you don't have to do much work in this area before your life seems to be lighter, much better there. Even if you have a long way to go, you start where you are for sure. And you don't despair ever. For for us Jesuits, that's the biggest sin. Yes, ma'am. How how do you explain the way you feel about education to regular people? Whereas I, <laughs> yeah, you know, like your your philosophy, and I would say I I was kind of on board with your philosophy a lot sooner than I read your books because I went to a vocational high school and had an unusual experience with education. And in this state now we have a, a recent law where students can't drop out of school and have to stay in school by law until the age of 18 so they're unable to dr even drop out and, and do some alternative education in high school which I think is cruel. I think that's the only word I can come up with because many kids shouldn't be there. And how do you explain the fact that your ideas about alternative education are actually compassionate? Because a lot of people think that the only way to be compassionate to kids and their educational needs is to force them to stay in school until 18. Uh, I had the good fortune to grow up in the realest part of the United States I've ever seen. Western Pennsylvania along the West Virginia border during the Second World War was my growing up time. There were people from all over the earth there and the, the idiom of that zone of the country was absolute plain talk and the advice if you got insulted was to strike back with maximum force none of this graduated force as a consequence people from all over the earth people with all kinds of economic differences were polite and cordial to one another because the, the alternative was to get into a fist fight right away. It was the only genuinely melted melting pot I've ever seen. And I learned there to talk straight, to be as clear as I could be, and not to put on airs with anybody. Although I had dispositions in that direction, you never let them show. Even though the Scotch-Irish were only one of about 70 different, you know, uh, cultures that were assembled there, they had given the place its, uh, its character originally. The Quakers had thrown the Scotch-Irish out of eastern Pennsylvania because they were so warlike and so ready to fight at the drop of a hat. They sent them to Western Pennsylvania, and then they denied Western Pennsylvania, these are the Quakers for you, they denied Western Pennsylvania any money for frontier defense. So the only large-scale Indian uprising in America, there are a lot of little ones, but the only big one, which the Indians swept the field for hundreds of miles, was uh, through the Alleghenies and they marched on Philadelphia and then the Quakers seemed to beg the Scotch Irish to send their militias to defend Philadelphia. I have no uh, argument with the Quakers, I rather like them, but, but the, the character of the community I grew up in communicated to me 
that essentially anybody can do anything, that you don't stand on degrees or titles, performance is the only sane way to measure anybody. So you ought to teach your A students have contempt for the A. Can they do anything that somebody else would say, wow, or that's meritorious, or we need you, come help us. I mean, we're drowning in A students right now. They don't have any idea what to do. Because <laughs> they listen to orders. There's no one available to give any orders or make any sense. One more question. We only have time for one more. What's your opinion on Einstein and objective? <sighs> That's your short answer. <laughs> I must say that, that when I got introduced to the world of libertarians, that was practically the first question I was asked. And, and oddly enough, I had read The Fountainhead, which I thought was a pretty good story there, although there was a bad movie made from it <laughs> there. But I wasn't thinking about the philosophy embedded in it. Uh, certainly enough people I respect admire Miss Rand, that there must be something there. So say that there's, a, there's an aesthetic disconnect between us, but that doesn't mean that, that, that I don't think there's something there. Uh, do I draw philosophic strength from writing? Absolutely, that's one of the things we disconnect kids from in school. If any of you in school had ever read, let me just pick three books out at random, uh, uh, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, you would have understood, as long as the school had helped you a little bit, oh my, you would have understood how a small force can take a larger, uh, more potent force and divide it against itself and win the battle because the stronger force is busy arguing among themselves. That's what you'd have learned from Caesar's Gallic Wars. If you ever read, uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, which we were compelled to read in seventh grade, I'm grateful for it. That's during the Second World War, before the schools really went down the toilet. Uh, what, what Aurelius shows you is the single wealthiest man on the whole planet, and the single most powerful man on the whole planet, says flatly that nothing you can buy with money or order with power is worth having. I could hug him for that. And finally, Thomas Hobbes, in the middle of the 17th century, spelled out how a monarch can keep a Leviathan state together. That's the name of the book, Leviathan. It's very easy to read. And you see something that still sophisticated people are unable to understand. What Hobbes said is, wherever power seems to be, it is never there. Not seldom there, it's never there. Where power seems to be is the front or the mouthpiece, the flak catcher for the real power. I'll tell you, it is a mighty, a potent idea to roll around in your head and test against the uh, uh, the George Bushes or the or anyone else, R really. So, so books should produce, and people spend years distilling one insight. But schools don't teach books that way. It's a good story. It's a bad story. Here, the details to memorize to pass the test. Mm -hmm. All right, no, we're no done. More. I'm afraid we're, we're done. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you all. Can I help you move into the book signing room? Yes, let me just pack up so that I won't go crazy. No, nope, that's fine. Uh,
For more information on John Taylor Gatto and his work, go to johntaylorgatto.com. More nonfiction books and authors later today.